Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody. Would you come to your feet and let's ask God to fill this place with his spirit and speak uh, to us during this time. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. There is a light that burns in the darkness. Oh, there is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. Oh, it is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we're on our knees with every heartbeat we bring you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. There is a king that reigns in victory. There is a king that reigns in victory. There is a mercy strong enough to save. Oh, we feel it rising up from the ashes. There is a love that overcame the grave. Let's sing that again. Oh. There is a love that overcame the grave. Father, we're on our knees with every heart beat away. Bring you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. Oh, oh, oh. Lord, come and fill this place. Oh, we need you, Lord. And I will worship you. I'll worship you. I'll worship you. You always, and I will worship you. I'll worship you. I'll worship you always. Let's sing that again. Lift your voices. And I will worship you. I'll worship you. I'll worship you. offering Lord come and fill this place Father we're crying out Spirit we need you now Glorious love surrounds us and I will worship you I'll worship you I'll worship you Let's 
sing that we will worship. And I will worship you. I'll worship you. I'll worship you always. Yes, amen. Hey, before you be seated, would you just turn around and greet one another? Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Awesome. So glad you're here and you've chosen to worship with us, whether you're here in person or maybe you're watching on the live stream. We're really, really excited to be here with you. You know, we're really grateful to, to live in a time where, um, you know, we remember that thing that we, we won't mention that happened a, a few years ago and we had to kind of stay in place and we had live stream and, and there's a lot of really cool things. But one of the things that I think that that period taught us is that there's more to being a church than just getting like teaching, right? You can, you can consume the messages online, um, but it's the fellowship and the friendship. And, and Mark's going to bring us a message today talking about that, that friendship. Um, but we actually uh, practiced that this weekend. Uh, last night we had a little church potluck, and so there's some, some pictures there. Um, I'm not in them because I'm in the corner eating all the food, um, but it was really good. So I appreciate you guys coming to that. And we had a great time, and we really appreciate everybody who, who brought food and helped serve um, and that, and so we really appreciate it. Um, another uh, cool thing we do as a church, uh, part of being a member of the church, is you get to come to, at least at Stafford Crossing, our connecting class. Connecting class is an opportunity for you. Maybe you've been coming around for a while. Maybe you're pretty new, but you kind of want to know what's the DNA of Stafford Crossing? What makes us tick? What sets us apart from other churches? Well, that's connecting class. Um, you'll learn more about it, and that's our official on-ramp uh, into church membership here at Stafford Crossing. And so you can sign up for that. You can see on the, the website there, staffordcrossing.org forward slash class. There's two, um, two training sessions for that that'll happen um, during one of our services. So just go on there, sign up, ask more questions, um, and you'll be sure to check that out. Now, you guys may know that there's a pretty big uh, holiday coming up in, in the life of our church and as Christians, uh, Easter um, and Good Friday. And so we want to make sure that you're aware of our time. So you can see first... Our Good Friday services are going to be Friday, April 8th. You can sign up there. There's no cost for that, but we do need you to sign up. It's going to be a special event there, and we need to make sure we know how many people are coming. And then, of course, we'll have, I think, a total of four Easter services. Yes, yeah, so we'll have them on Saturday uh, and then three Sunday mornings, so different times Sunday morning. Make sure you check that out, um, and we look forward to celebrating Easter Sunday with you as a church family. With that, would you come back to your feet as we continue to sing praises to our risen King? Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. So amazing, yeah. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. 
Is it true that you are thinking of me and how you love me? It's amazing, oh, it's amazing, yeah, it's amazing. I am a friend of God, oh, I am a friend of God. A friend of God, He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. He calls me friend. Oh, He calls me friend. Oh. So John 15, 12 through 17 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask for, in, uh, sorry, for whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. What an amazing relationship that we have been invited to with our God, the one who has given us life, the one who has created everything that we see and we enjoy. It is amazing, and we should rejoice in this, that God loves us and calls us his friend. Let's commit ourselves to love our God and honor him with our lives completely by being obedient to his commands, to love as he has loved, to lay down our lives for each other and for our God, just as Jesus laid down his life for us. And so we're going to continue and just thank him, singing, God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Yeah. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Oh, God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Oh, God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend of God. Yeah. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. That was weird. My mic just like turned. I don't know if anyone saw that. That was really strange. <laughs> so as we continue in our series looking at the life of David, um, let's enter this time with, with openness. Let's lay aside our preconceived notions. Let's even lay down our normal expectations as we open his word. Let's expect one thing, and that's for God to speak to us. For him to draw near to us, for him to open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts to receive what he has for us. 
And so we are going to ask him to do that, to open up our minds, open up our hearts, and to see exactly what he wants us to see, to hear exactly what he wants us to hear. And we're going to do that by singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Lord, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, Lord. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Holy, 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 you are holy, 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 I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love and as we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 sing holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 you are holy, 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 I want to see you. Yes, God, I just pray that you would speak to us now, that you would shine in the light of your glory. As we look to your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak through every letter every even the um just the the symbolism and the metaphors that we can see and then uh, god i just pray that you would just speak through everything but that you would shine brighter than even the 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 fun things that mark's gonna bring god, that you would speak through that that you would give uh mark the power that he needs to be able to to present what you have for us 
So God, be glorified in this time and be honored with it as well. Pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. back into our series, The Life of David. Pretty excited to uh, get back into this. We're doing a bit of a character study for the last several weeks. We got uh, a couple weeks to go yet. A study of the character of David, because he's a pretty significant guy in the Old Testament. Uh, much of, of First and Second Samuel was written about David. Many of the Psalms are written by David. Even the Proverbs, while we recognize they're written by David's son Solomon, they're seen as, as the father's wisdom being given to his son. So we, we know that he's a contributor in there as well. And so, so a guy who's got this much ink in Scripture is a character worth studying. And so today we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to kind of move forward and backward from there a little bit as we consider the friendship between David and Jonathan. It's a famous friendship and one that we can, that we can learn much from. It was an amazing friendship, a valuable friendship. And I would suggest probably unlike the friendships that most of us experience. At least speaking for myself, and I'm guessing I'm not alone, this type of friendship is not common, not typical. It doesn't come easy. What we call friendship today, I would suggest, is kind of a counterfeit of this type of friendship. Maybe not even a counterfeit, maybe just a shadow of this type of friendship. We stink at friendship. We're just not that good at it. We've even kind of redefined the actual word friendship, and we've removed so much of the value from it because it's hard. So we're just not good at it. 2009, Burger King demonstrated this to us. They ran a promotion called the Whopper Sacrifice. Some of us remember that. Burger King offered a free Whopper if you would unfriend 10 people on Facebook and send them a screenshot of that unfriending. If you were willing to sacrifice 10 friends, you could get a free Whopper. And so 233,000 terminated friendships later, 23,000 free Whoppers given out, Burger King had to pull the plug on the promotion. They gave us too much credit. They couldn't believe how many people were willing to sacrifice 10 friends for a mediocre hamburger. And yet, here we are, living in the wake of that. So, so while I have a list of people that I call friend, each one of those relationships, worth approximately a tenth of a hamburger, would suggest that I am not very good at friendship. I'm not good at being a friend. I'm not good at having friends. I'm not good at making friends. And here we are. In fact, we're so bad at it. When we read the account of David and Jonathan, it is so foreign to us, we don't have a category that that relationship fits in. And, and it's sad when, when you read some of the, the, the people who think they understand what's going on here, they would suggest that, that this friendship was like an exaggerated, embellished, almost a cartoon image of friendship between two soldiers in the same, in, in the same, on the same team. And, and others would even suggest that, that this relationship between David and Jonathan was a, a romantic relationship. People have tried to put this relationship in buckets that we understand because we don't even understand what friendship is. And so this category of friendship is foreign to me, and I've got so much to learn from this that I'm looking forward to hearing from God through his word. This is not an exaggerated, embellished relationship, and this is absolutely not a romantic relationship. This is friendship, and it's friendship that we were created to have, friendship that we were created to be in. And yet again, we've lost it. As David just read from John 15, verses 12 and 13, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is saying, my command to you is to be a friend the way I'm your friend, and I died for you. 
That's his command for us. He expects us as his disciples, as his followers, to be in this type of friendship relationship. He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to us. And he says, I will die for you, friend. And I expect you to do the same for your friend. So we are called to be in this incredible friendship. And yet again, we've, we've lost it. This idea of friendship that Jesus gives to us is, is foreshadowed by David and Jonathan in this account. It's true friendship. It is that true ride or die friendship that we so often talk about, but that we don't really practice. It's that real relationship that is worth so much more than even Burger King could offer. So today, hopefully, we're going to walk away understanding that our ability to be a true friend is found in our friendship with Jesus. It is by his example and his friendship that we can be in a true friendship, true friend relationship, and we can get better at this. So by his example and by his grace, let's see about that. Let's pray before we jump into 1 Samuel chapter 18. God, we do love you. And Father, we are thankful for your word. Father, we are thankful for your command, for your directive on our lives. Father, show us how to be obedient. Father, show us, be, amaze us by the fact that you call us friend. And then, Father, may we be a friend that represents you well. So, God, give us strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 5 is where we'll start. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, this is speaking of David, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So here's a conversation that's going on. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, conversation between Saul and David and Abner is in the, in, in the room. And it seems Jonathan is in the room listening. So we have a glimpse of a conversation here that is a bigger one than, than the details that we've got. But if we go back just a couple verses in chapter 17, verse 57, 58. As soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So, so the only thing we have of the conversation is, Whose son are you? I'm Jesse's son. But here's young David walks in with the head of Goliath in his hand. And I can just picture this young man sitting down and sitting the head next to him. There's more conversation than whose son are you? Saul has brought in, Saul's the king, and he's brought in Abner, his general, David, the victorious soldier, and his son, the, the, the presumed prince, standing by. So they're talking about the battle. Saul is saying, what did we learn? What did we learn about the enemy? What did we learn about ourselves? What was going through your mind, David, when you stepped up on the battlefield where nobody else would step up? Saul is asking these questions as a leader. And so there's some conversation going on here, and it's out of that conversation that Jonathan hears a man a lot like him. Jonathan hears a man whose passion is for the Almighty God. Yes, he's a soldier, and he's successful, and he's got a great future coming, all very respectable, but he hears a man who is after God's heart. And, and we know that because when David was fighting against Goliath back in chapter 17, he says the battle is the Lord's. He says to Goliath, the battle is the Lord's and he will deliver you into our hands. This is his battle for his glory, for his name, his power. And so we see this in David and he would have been recounting this battle. And if we go back just a few chapters to chapter 14, we see something very similar in Jonathan. Jonathan and his armor bearer, armor bearer take on a whole garrison of Philistine soldiers and they defeat him. And, and in that, Jonathan says, nothing can hinder the Lord from delivering by many or by few. So both of them are recognizing this is God's battle. They're soldiers. They're on the battlefield together. They face death. They fight hard. They would have each other's back. All of this true of them as soldiers. But what knit them together was that they served the same God. They served the same purpose. What they did risking their lives was for the glory of God, for the name of the living God. 
And they were like each other in this. They lived for the same cause. They would die for the same cause. So they were, they were close because of their desire to serve the living God. And out of this, their friendship is born. We see this. This is almost like a meeting, but it's like instantly we're on the same page. By God's grace, here we are. So their friendship was born, but their friendship is then cultivated over the next few chapters. You see, that it was started here in this room, but there was work to be done. This wasn't going to happen by accident. And I fear that's the first place where we start to miss the boat. And we think friendship is just going to happen. It's just going to happen naturally. It doesn't require any work. If it requires work, then, then I'm, it's, it's not worth it. And so we don't cultivate a friendship. We don't do the work. We like to think it's just going to happen, but that's a wrong look at friendship. This conversation happened, but the friendship grew from this. Consider when, when you were a kid, or at least when I was a kid. In my neighborhood, I had, I had three friends. Small neighborhood, but there were three guys that were about my age, and if we were going to play outside, we were going to play together. And out of those three, that was one that I really liked. He's just a good friend. We had a lot of similar, similar uh, interests, a lot of similar skills. We spoke the same language. It was all good stuff. And so I would like to play with him. But you know what? I would put up with these other two because my friend pool was pretty shallow. If I couldn't walk to their house, I couldn't be their friend. I couldn't be friends with people 100 miles away in those days because I was there. So to be their friends, I would overlook their flaws. I would overlook our differences. I would put up with doing things that weren't my favorite things to do for the sake of that friendship. That's why when we're kids, we, we make friends. We don't just find friends. We recognize that there's a little bit of work to be done. We're put together geographically by our parents' decisions, and our friendships are going to be there. So we invest in those. We do a little bit of work and make some sacrifice for the sake of friends. But then I got a car, and my geography widened out. And so these three guys weren't my only options anymore. And, and so my friend group changed. Like I could go find guys that I didn't have to put up with so much, that, that I didn't have to, have to invest in. I could find more people who would just really like me and it was just easy to, to be with them because my geography was changing. And then I add social media, and it's like now i got four billion people to pick from. And I can say, you, you can be my friend, but you better thrill me. And if you don't thrill me, I'll find somebody who does because there's a lot of competition out there. So now I'm in a place where it's like, if you're not thrilling me, if I'm not dazzled by our friendship, I can just move on because i got a lot to pick from. So I've lost this, this making friends, this, this, this just friends showing up at my doorstep has made me lazy in the way I pursue friendships. So I've lost that, that childhood skill of making friends and being a good friend. So let's look at what Jonathan did to be a friend. He's going to be our example today. And, and we can guess that David was doing the same thing. This was a good friendship. David was trying to do the same thing because, because you don't have a Jonathan-type friend if you're not willing to be a Jonathan-type friend. Everyone wants a Jonathan-type friend, but do we want to be a Jonathan-type friend? And that's the reality. If we're going to have them, it's because we're going to be them. Everyone wants one, but we all need to learn to be one. So what does it take to be a friend like Jonathan? We'll compare Jonathan to Saul as we look at this. And I know Saul is not really a friendly guy. It doesn't look like he's a friend with David, but we'll see that, that, that he does kind of make that attempt. Now, I would suggest that Saul is kind of looking forward maybe to our 2023 version of friend. And it's like, I want you to be my friend as long as you're, 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 you're serving me, as, as long as you bring value to me, as long as you make me happy, you can be my friend. I would suggest that Jonathan's kind of, or, or Saul is looking forward to, to, to his friendship as being that you know, friendship that might be worth a tenth of a hamburger, kind of the way we do. So we're going to see the difference between Saul and Jonathan as we look in this. First thing we're going to see is that friends commit, not control. Friends commit, not control. Verses 2 and 3. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. We can immediately see the difference. Saul says, I'm going to control. I'm going to control your schedule. I'm going to control where you are. I'm going to keep you nearby because I need you to make me happy. This is about me. This is about serving me. I want you nearby. I'm going to control you. I'm going to control your schedule because I need you here. I'll tell you where to be. I'll tell you when you're going to be there so that you can make me happy. And as long as you're serving me, I'll keep you around and we'll be friends. 
But Jonathan, on the other hand, commits. He makes a covenant with David. Our understanding is more kind of a contract type of friendship. As long as you keep producing, as long as you keep making me happy, then I'll keep investing. As long as you keep doing what I want, I'll keep you around. But Jonathan says here, he makes a covenant, which is a one way. This is not a matter of when you stop pleasing me, I'm going to kick you to the curb. No, this is, I'm here for the long haul. I'm here for the hard times. I'm here for the bad days. Jonathan made a covenant. And this would turn out to be the case in their friendship. In, in, in the passage that, we, that we're looking at today, what we see is in this relationship, David receives a lot. David doesn't give a lot. Jonathan gives a lot. Jonathan doesn't receive a lot. In this season in life, David needs a friend. He needs someone to come alongside him. Jonathan is that person. It's kind of a one-sided relationship in this season, and that's real. That's where this covenant relationship comes from. That's where this committed friendship comes from. It's a hard season for David. Jonathan's got to carry a lot of weight, but he committed to it. He said, our friendship is worth it. During this time, I'm going to do the work. And we see later, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 9, where David is returning the favor for Jonathan, where he's caring for Jonathan's family, but it's after Jonathan's dead. So in this relationship, Jonathan is investing and giving. He's committed to it. And he's helping David, and he's not receiving a great deal from it. If this were a 50-50 proposition, Jonathan would have bailed a long time ago. But he's investing, he's doing the hard work of friendships because friends commit, not control. Next we see friends give, not get. Verse 4, Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David, and his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. So, so we, we see that, that Saul's goal in this was very selfish. Saul, Saul's goal in this was to to keep David close for his happiness. Saul did something that looked friendly. He said, hey, shepherd boy, peasant, you can come live in the, in the palace with me and you can eat my food. And when I'm sad, you can play your instrument and, and you can make me happy. So it looks like he's doing a kind and friendly thing, but he's only doing it for his own benefit. He's keeping David around because he wants to be comforted. He wants to be secure. David's a good soldier. So his comfort and his security demand that he would keep David close but it was for his own purpose. And, and I fear sometimes we're the same way. Like we, we, we will do just the bare minimum of, of friendliness in an effort to keep somebody close by because I need you here to make me happy. I don't want to feel alone. I don't want to be sitting by myself. I, I want to want, believe that I've got a friendship. But I think sometimes we sacrifice our friends. And again, sacrificing friends for a hamburger is something to laugh about, maybe cry a little bit about. But we, we may sacrifice friendships because of, of comfort. We may sacrifice friendships because of, of what, what we think we can get out of it. On the altar of comfort, on the altar of security, we may sacrifice friendships. But Jonathan was committed. Jonathan was willing to risk for this relationship with David. And it was great risk. He would risk his life. And again, this is a bit of a one-way relationship at this point. But he's willing to risk for this relationship. He was willing to make great sacrifice. And his commitment to David was at great cost. Here it cost him his robe, it cost him his armor, it cost him his sword. He's giving these things to David. And basically what he's saying, these are the indicators of his future kingship. And he's saying, I can't be the future king and be your friend. I'm giving up my future. I'm giving up my comfort. I'm giving up my security for this friendship. When he hands him the sword, if he thought David were a threat and not a friend, he'd have given him the pointy end of the sword. But instead, he gives him the handle of the sword. He said, it's yours. You are the future king. I recognize that. He sacrifices not only his future insecurity, but his safety for this relationship. He had every right to hold on to those things. Every right to hold on. But he willingly gave them up. Jonathan was selfless, not selfish. Saul kept David close because of what he could do. It's kind of like on, on, on social media. I give likes so that I can get likes. I give popularity so I can get popularity. It looks like I'm being friendly, but it's really all about me. That was Saul. That was not Jonathan. Saul looked like he was being a friend, but he wasn't. Jonathan was being a true friend in sacrifice, in giving up for the relationship. So friends, commit, not control. Friends, give, not get. 
Next, we see friends celebrate, not compete. Verses 6 and 7. As they were coming home when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. So the people are celebrating, celebrating Saul, but also celebrating David. It seems like a good time to celebrate. They won this battle. Things are going well, but Saul could not stand to have his name mentioned with this young shepherd peasant boy. His ego was too fragile for this. And so he snapped. I think about Jonathan on the other hand. Jonathan was probably singing along. This is a good day for the nation of Israel. As a soldier, I'm celebrating. We're making advances. This is good stuff. He was probably celebrating even though they weren't singing about him. Again, that battle in chapter 14 where Jonathan and his armor bearer won an unexpected battle, that was worth singing about. That, that may have been a battle that changed the direction. Like, like that, was, that was worth celebrating, but nobody was singing about Jonathan, but Jonathan was okay with that. He would celebrate his friends. He would celebrate his friend's success, his friend's other friends. He would celebrate when his friend is getting, getting things that make him happy. It, it's, it's not as though his, his, his happiness is limited. You know, if we think about happiness as a zero-sum game, if I think my friend is getting more happiness, that means there's less for me to get. When in reality, when my friend is winning and I can celebrate him, my happiness increases. There's happiness to go around. Saul didn't get that, but Jonathan did. He would celebrate the, the, the victories that David had. And so we can see the differences in these friendships. We can see the difference between Jonathan and Saul. Jonathan, a true friend of David. Saul, a very, a very toxic relationship. And I use that term carefully, but I mean it. It's a deadly relationship between Saul and David because Saul doesn't know how to be a friend. And so then I think about it. What about the bigger picture? Me, me being friends with somebody, that has impact. And Jesus has called me to be that kind of friend to somebody. Let's do that. But what if it impacts other relationships too? What if there's something bigger going on here? What if the experience of being a friend and the exercise of being a friend has impact on my other relationships? What, what if in being a friend, I'm learning to be a better father, a better husband, a better brother, a better son? What if I'm learning better relationships as I practice and exercise my friendship? If, if we look at the evidence from Saul's life, chapters 18 to 20, I encourage you, read those chapters this week. Crazy stuff happens in those chapters. Saul is off the rails. And, and it's, it's scary to watch to see what he's capable of. But look at his other family relationships in verse 11. And Saul hurled his spear at David and said, I will pin David to the wall, but David evaded him twice. So, so Saul has already tried to kill David. All right, so that's not good for a friendship. So he tries to mend it. And he says, I'm going to let you marry my oldest daughter, Merab. And his plan is, if he's in my house, if he's married to my daughter, I can send him to the worst battles and he will die in battle. And, and recognize what, what David did last week that we saw, where he sent his adversary into battle in an effort to kill him. It's not an accident that it happens this way. But Saul would send him that way. So he says, yeah, you can marry my daughter Merab. And so, all right, we're getting this thing all set up. Merab is already engaged to be married to another soldier. Saul has already given Merab to another soldier. And so how do you think that relationship's going right now? Dad, did you not remember? I'm kind of married already. You, you can't give me away. All right, so, so here's Saul in his relationship with his daughter, Merab, broken. So, so he says, okay, instead I'll give you my daughter, Michael, younger daughter. And, and so they get married. Michael loves David. Saul sends his guys to try to kill David. Michael works this crazy plan to hide David, humiliating her father. And I'm thinking, there's another broken relationship. Father-daughter cannot even see each other at this point because she humiliated him and thwarted his plan. So the daughter's no good relationship with. Verse 30, chapter 20, verse 30. Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse, <laughs> you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? This is Paul yelling at his son. How do you think his relationship with his wife is after this comment? <laughs> and then later we see in verses 32 to 34, Jonathan answered Saul, his father, 
Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. Saul just threw his spear at his son because his son was friends with David. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month. For he was grieved, because they, grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. So the last straw, he tries to kill his own son. Relationship with his wife, relationship with his family, totally falling apart. He doesn't know how to be a friend. He doesn't know how to relate to people. So Saul blew it with David and blew it with his entire family. And I think he's got to be feeling more and more alone. What about us? Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling alone? Are you feeling lonely? Are relationships going sideways? Is it because we've never practiced being a good friend? What if when the things get really tough, we don't throw our hands up and say, I don't need friends? What about when things get really hard? We say, instead of, I don't need friends, my friends need me. What if that's our practice? What if that's our practice in our marriages, in our relationships, when things get hard? I don't throw my hands up and walk away. My wife needs me. My kids need me. My friends need me. So I'm going to stick around. I'm going to be a Jonathan-type friend. So we see where this friend relationship impacts, seems to impact, at least in Saul's case, and I would suggest in ours, that practice of friendship impacts our relationships. But even bigger than that, consider why this story is even in this, even in Scripture. We know that these stories of the Old Testament are pointing us forward to Jesus. So back to that verse that we started with, John 15, 12, and 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. This relationship, this Jonathan friendship is a shadow of the real friendship of Jesus. And Jesus makes us his friend. He lays down his life for his friends. And he calls us to do the same. And we can all have noble thoughts and think, if I had to die to save my friend's life, I want to think that I would do it. And I'll probably never get the chance to prove that. But what if today, laying down my life for my friends is laying down my schedule, laying down my preference on what we're going to do today, laying down my finances, laying down my heart to serve my friend? What if that's what laying down my life looks like today? We can learn from Jesus who ultimately died for his friend. Jesus' friendship to us. He calls us disciples. He calls us friends. We don't deserve it. This is a one-sided relationship. We need a friend. We said back when David was fighting Goliath, be careful not to consider yourself like David because you're not the hero of the story. In this particular one, David needs a hero. The hero is Jonathan. So let us consider ourselves like David here. Say, I need a friend. I need a friend who will commit, who will covenant. I need a friend who will lay his life down for me. I need a Savior. I need Jesus. Jesus committed to being my friend. He laid his life down for me. There was nothing I could do to repay him, to make it worth it for him to be in this relationship, but he gave for me. He was generous, and he celebrates the victory that he gave me. In his death, I have victory over sin and death, and he celebrates with me. He says, I call you friends. I chose you, and I will do what it takes to be your friend. So today, let's think of ourselves as David. We need a friend. That friend is Jesus. If you are a friend of Jesus, take what you know of that relationship and apply it to your friendships. Apply it to your earthly relationships. Let us represent our friend well in the way we treat each other. So we are like David in this story. But we have a friend like Jonathan, and that friend is Jesus. And in his friendship, we have the capacity to be true friends to those around us, to be selfless, to be giving, to lay down our lives for our friends in light of what Jesus did for us. Will we represent him well? Friends, think about it. If, if you're looking around and there's a suspicious lack of these type of friends in your world, perhaps it's because you're not being this type of friend. It's not going to happen by accident. Sitting and waiting for a friend is not going to work. Let us seek to be a Jonathan. Beyond that, seek to be a friend like Jesus. And that starts with community. And we saw the pictures of the potluck. We as a church are creating community. That's, that's in our vision statement. Opportunities to get together, to meet each other, to find those relationships, to, be, to, to start being friendly, and then to determine where is it that we're going to be that kind of friend got the potluck. We've got coming up in, in April something called the Connection Cafe. Connection Cafe is going to be something on Sunday mornings where it's the same thing. It's just, let's strike up a conversation because out of that cultivated ground, we're going to start to develop friendships. 
And when we start to develop friendships, it's out of those friendships that we start to make disciples and start to be discipled. That's our catalyst groups. So from these connection events and engage groups into catalyst groups, making disciples, being friends who invest because it will never be free. It's going to cost you time and energy and maybe heartache to be a friend. But we are cultivating those opportunities for the purpose of making disciples, all out of the desire to be obedient to the one who calls us friend, the one who died for us, committed in covenant to us, gave all for us, and celebrates now with us. Let's pray. God, we love you. And Father, we are thankful for your love. We're thankful for your mercy. Father, we're thankful for your friendship. Lord, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus, whom you sent to die in our place, to give everything so that you can call us friend. Father, may we be amazed by that. May we be motivated by that, to be friends to others. Father, may our friendships be what sets us apart in this world. As Jesus said, this is how the world will know that we're his disciples. It's our love for one another. Father, may we be friends. May we be more than Jonathan friends. May we strive to be friends like Jesus. And Father, we are so thankful for the gift that you've given us, that you no longer call us enemies. You no longer call us slaves. You call us friends. Father, we are thankful for that gift, and we will never take it for granted. May we use that to impact this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mark. So as we're uh, closing, we're going to sing one last song. And this song is the new one that we introduced last week uh, called Run to the Father. And as we sing, let's delight in our God who is always there for us to run to. We desperately needed saving and, and we needed fixing. And through Jesus, he provided that for us. So let's stand and let us praise him together. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now. I'm laying it down. And I know that I Run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh. Had a plan from the start And your son for redemption Price for my heart I don't have a context For that kind of love I don't understand comprehend all I know is I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my soul needs a friend so I run to the Father again and again
crush deep in my chest. Your mercy is calling out just as I am. You pull me in and I know I need you now. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon. My soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. Again and again and again. Oh, Hey, thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, just a reminder, our ushers will be at the door, so if you have your connection cards, your tithes, your offerings, you can leave them um, with the ushers. And also our prayer team will be up front. So if you have any prayer needs, please, they would love to pray with you. Um, we hope to see you next Sunday. Have a great and blessed week.